Yes, exactly. All right, guys. All right, as, uh, as uh, long promised, so this is our last um, uh, bit of uh, uh, kinematics. Um, and uh, actually, hopefully, by the end of today, you'll be uh, well motivated um, to <coughs> start thinking about uh, becoming uh, expert projective geometer so that when we spend the next couple of, uh, the, 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 the next two or three lectures, uh, doing this sort of thing, you'll uh, you'll have uh, some idea of why we're going to find it interesting. And um, uh, but uh, today we're going to cover uh, twister space and momentum twister space. And we did 15 minutes of this a little while ago, but uh, uh, let's just do it properly again. Um, the zeroth order motivation. <coughs> for thinking about twister space is sort of uh, is purely kinematical um, uh, and has to do with the fact that uh, uh, we're often interested in e either theories that have conformal symmetry um, or we're interested in the action of conformal transformations. Uh, either way, so uh, theories of massless particles with dimensionless interactions like Yang-Mills theory in four dimensions have conformal symmetry at tree level. Uh, anyway, classically, they have conformal symmetry. And more generally, the sort of conformal structure of space-time is something um, uh, important to think about. As I reminded you, the exciting aspect of conformal transformations is not the scaling symmetry, which is sort of obvious. If you have massless particles, no scales, uh, you can rescale all the energies, all the length scales, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and um, everything is invariant or Observables are only functions of ratios of those uh, quantity. There's no absolute um, mass scales. But the interesting part of uh, conformal transformations are the inversions. This is the things that surprising that there's an invariance under taking x mu to uh, uh, x mu over x squared. And as I reminded you, um, you've probably run into this, even if you haven't had any exposure to conformal field theory before, you've probably run into this when you've solved for the problem of the electric field outside a conducting sphere. Uh, you know the way you're supposed to solve this problem. Um, if the sphere has some radius uh, uh, r, and, uh, and, the, and the first charge you're interested in out here, q, is out here uh, at some distance capital R, that you're supposed to put in the inverted point here, little r squared over r, some charge q prime that you have to work out. But you can put a charge there such that the surface of the sphere um, is an equipotential surface. Right? If that's a little surprising that that's possible. Uh, and the fact that that's possible is precisely reflecting the fact that the theory has a conformal symmetry. Okay? And so you're seeing it, just the action under inversion. By the way, what is this action in terms of our favorite alpha alpha dot coordinates? It's just that it's the matrix x alpha alpha dot just gets literally inverted to the inverse matrix uh, with an upstairs alpha dot alpha. Okay. All right. So, um, so that's a discrete symmetry. Uh, but what we can do is uh, is take some. So here's an origin. We can take some point x. Uh, uh, we can first invert it to some point um, x inverted. We can do a little translation, and then we can invert it back. So this is x inverted plus delta x, and then we can invert it back. So that's going to give us a, new, uh, a nearby point, x inverted plus delta x inverted. Okay, And that action. This little action, which is now an infinitesimal uh, action, is the special conformal transformation. OK, and uh, I won't write out all the indices, because we'll, we'll do it slightly more elegantly uh, uh, in a second anyway, at least for, the, uh, for amplitudes of interest. But, um, 
uh, as we mentioned al also last time, if we look at all the symmetries that we have in space-time, uh, let's just write them down schematically. So what are all the space-time symmetries? They're the sort of most obvious ones, kind of in order. The most obvious ones are translations. They look like DDX. I'm not even going to bother putting uh, any indices on it, right? So translations look like DDX. Those are known in antiquity somehow. Um, rotations and Lorentz transformations more generally uh, look like X DDX, right? So, um, so these are translations. These are uh, part of Lorentz, so boosts and rotations. And um, by the way, uh, what about, uh, um, and then the, these interesting special conformal transformations look like XX DDX. OK? And uh, together with the uh, dilations, so just the overall, uh, so we also have uh, the more trivial ones, the uh, dilations. Together, all of these uh, give us a 15-parameter uh, set of symmetries in four-dimensional spacetime. Right? So we have 4 plus 6. Another four of these special conformal uh, transformations plus the uh, dilations makes 10. But um, as you can see, these things are treated on a rather different footing. right? So all of these things commute into some large uh, conformal group. But somehow, when we decide to label them by points in spacetime, uh, when we uh, talk about their action on points in spacetime, they're treated rather differently. So all the generators look kind of uh, different from each other. OK, so the first question is to find some set of variables on which the conformal transformations act nicely. And um, a clue is if we just think about uh, we have two points in spacetime x and y. <coughs> Let's ask what happens to x minus y squared. Oh, sorry, I didn't write this down. Uh, so the, uh, the uh, dilations also look like an x ddx, where all these indices are contracted with each other, so that we're just, uh, uh, we're just rescaling everything. All right, so if I look at um, uh, two points, uh, x minus y, uh, x and y, and we look at the distance between them, we can ask what happens to this under inversions. And it's a very quick computation to show that under inversions, this goes to x minus y squared over x squared y squared. So of course, the distance is not invariant under inversions. It's of course not, uh, obviously, it's not uh, scale invariant. But this gives us an idea of what is uh, conformally invariant is uh, if two points are null separated. So if two points are null separated, the notion of null separation is conformally invariant. And so, um, so what that means is if I take two points in space time, and I do a totally general conformal transformation on them. I can move the points around. If they're far, I can move them close. If they're close, I can move them far. right? Um, but a light ray gets mapped to a light ray. Okay, so conformal transformations act nicely on light rays. And so we should figure out how to nicely characterize light rays. So, um, so let's now talk about null rays. And um, we're going to ad identify, we're going to understand a little bit better what rays means um, in a second. But at least intuitively, if I, 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 want, the whole, I want a whole collection of points um, such that uh, some linear space, such that any two points on, on, on this ray are null separated from each other. So that means that if I take any two points, 1 and 2, along this ray, I have to have x1 minus x2 squared equals 0, or in the language of our alpha alpha dot matrices, 
these matrices have to have vanishing, this difference of x1 and x2 has to have vanishing determinant, which means that x1 and x2 has to have a null vector. So, so that in turn tells us that we can think of every point along this ray as satisfying an equation that looks like x alpha alpha dot. Here is the null vector lambda alpha is equal to mu alpha dot. I'm not going to put a tilde on this guy. So everywhere you see a mu, mu's are always going to have the alpha dot indices. I'm not going to put a tilde on it for a reason that will become uh, apparent in a second, because I want to imagine lambda and mu uh, grouped together. So, um, OK, so, so you see this makes it manifest. If I take two points, so if I look at all the x's that satisfy this equation, there are four x's, space of x's four dimensional. So this is two linear conditions on x's, right? So this is a two dimensional plane in x space. There's some two dimensional plane in x space which satisfies this equation. All right? And any two points on this two dimensional plane are not separated from each other. Because if I take the difference between these two equations for any two of the points, I find a null vector for x1 minus x2, so the determinant of x1 minus x2 is 0. OK? So this is called the incidence relation. All these things go back to Penrose, of course. And uh, without further ado, we can see um, what is a nice way of characterizing a null ray? A nice way of characterizing a null ray is just give me a lambda and a mu. Right? So if you give me a lambda and a mu, I have a null ray. This is how I find the null ray, all the points on this, on this uh, that satisfied these equations. So I'm going to group the lambda and the mu together into a four vector, zi. So i is going to run from 1 to 4, um, which is lambda alpha in one component and mu uh, alpha dot and the bottom two components. Now, already we see something uh, interesting, which is that um, lambda and mu don't uniquely specify the null ray. And that's obvious, because if I just multiply this equation by any number, I, I'm not changing what the solutions are. right? So if you give me lambda and mu, and 2 times lambda and 2 times mu, they specify the same null ray. Okay, so there's an, there's an equivalence that z and any multiple of z give me the same, the same null ray. So immediately, if you just think of this as a 4 vector, uh, it's not really a 4 vector. The z's, uh, after this equivalence, uh, live in a three-dimensional projective space. And at the moment, I'm being, um, I'm being sloppy, uh, as I'll always be in this course. I'm not, I'm not going to write RP3 or CP3. We'll just write P3. And depending on the context you're in, you know what you're supposed to do. Okay? But just to say again, when everything is real here, when everything is real, um, if it's RP3, we're going to be dealing with 2 comma 2 signature. <laughs> just like when the lambdas and lambda tildes were real, we're dealing with 2 2 signature. Or we could deal with everything complex, in which case there's no signature choice at all. Everything is just uh, complex. All right. Now, um, uh, at this level, there's not projective space is totally trivial. As I've said many times, we'll spend the next few lectures uh, getting you uh, very comfortable to live there. But for now, we're just going to talk about some, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're not going to do much, uh, uh, any geometry really in this, uh, uh, in this class. Um, OK, so we'll be talking a, lo a lot more about how to think about, uh, about uh, P3 later. But actually, we're not, quite, um, we're not quite done. We're not quite done yet. Let's see. Uh, so this is a nice way of talking about null rays. Let's see how conformal transformations act on, this, uh, on these variables. And so if I take this, if I take this four vector z, let's see how some obvious symmetries act on it. So some obvious symmetries are, well, I can take, um, I can take uh, an SL2 up here, an SL2 down there. 
And those two are the Lorentz transformations. Okay? Right, they just act on lambda and they lack uh, and they act on uh, mu. So they act on the two kinds of, of indices. Okay. Now here's an obvious transformation. What are translations? So let's say I translate x goes to x plus some fixed vector. I don't know, v alpha alpha dot. Then that just translates mu goes to mu plus v alpha alpha dot lambda alpha. So that's beautiful. Translations are also a linear transformation on the space of mu's and lambdas. And it's the block that lives down here. Remember, this is a lambda and a mu. So if you just give me any old matrix in this block, okay, and you think of that as a linear transformation that acts on this vector, then it shifts mu, goes to mu, plus something times lambda. So these are the translations. OK, finally, um, let's come back to this incidence relation. And multiply uh, left and right by x inverse. We do that, we get a new formula, x inverse alpha alpha dot upstairs mu alpha dot equals lambda alpha. So we see that under inversions, we just interchange mu and lambda. That's a very nice linear transformation, 0, 1, 1, 0. OK. So, and since we know that translations and everything else are just linear transformations, that tells us that the special conformal transformations are a linear transformation on mu and lambda 2. And of course, where are they? They are right up there. So it's paid off. Um, we decide to talk about null vectors. Uh, null rays, and we see that uh, null rays are associated with these four vectors, modulo rescaling, so they really live in P3. And the kinematic point is that they're nicely acted on, that conformal transformations just act as SL4, as 4 by 4 linear transformations on these guys. Yes? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean, all rays in space time? No, we're not. We're, we're talking about it. We're, we're, uh, this is saying something else. This is saying that if you give me a point in P3, canonically associated with a point in P3, I have some null ray in space time. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the point. So that's why we have to mod out by this. Uh, that's why we have to mod out by this rescaling. So after you mod out by the uh, rescaling, given, given a vector in P4, uh, given a vector in four dimensions up to rescaling, you get a ray in uh, space time. All right, so, uh, so what we see is that. So summarizing, the conformal group is SL4. Now, again, um, uh, if I'm in 2-2 uh, two -two signature, it's l literally SL4R. If I'm in 3-1 signature, just as we saw with lambdas and lambda tildes, you need some kind of hermeticity requirement. So, you're, uh, so the, the full complex Lorentz group is SL2C cross SL2C. To find the real Minkowski Lorentz group, you have to find the sort of a diagonal in the SL2C. In the two SL2Cs, it has a, a reality structure. Lambda tilde is a complex conjugate of lambda. The analog of that is that there's a subgroup of this SL4C, which is SU2, comma 2. And then, of course, in the, in the complex, uh, yeah, so in the complex, it's just SL4C. Sometimes we call this O4, 2. But if you like, the kind of hint that there's something interesting going on is that uh, uh, the hint that there's something interesting going on is that uh, already the Lorentz symmetries of space time look like linear transformations. 
And now we see that the Lorentz symmetry, the translations, and the conformal transformations all group together into a giant symmetry that acts as just flat out linear transformations, four by four linear transformations. Yes? Yes. Um, yeah. So, uh, so the, the, uh, I'll, I'll probably say something about all of these issues when we talk uh, more about uh, projective geometry. Okay. So, so don't don't worry about the slightly singular uh, uh, issues now. Indeed, we've taken space time. We've added a point at infinity to compactify it, so that conformal transformations can act on it nicely. Uh, if we if we don't add a point at infinity, then inversions don't actually make sense because the origin doesn't go anywhere. Okay. So, so, so you can't. Uh, uh, so you have to decide how you're adding something at infinity, and you choose an origin, and you have to say that the origin goes somewhere under inversion. Okay? So we have to add that point back in. Um, but all of, that will become, uh, uh, all of that will become clear. Um, uh, but, but also, part of the reason I'm doing these things a little quickly is some part of this subject has a little bit of reputation. You have to be very careful and sort of nervous all the time and thinking about these things. You do not have to be careful or nervous at all. This is the most trivial thing there is. Okay? So do not be scared. Do not worry. Do not think there's any subtleties. There's no subtleties. And if you think algebraically, nothing will ever bother you. Um, so uh, that's part of the point I'm trying to do it quickly, just so you see there's nothing very cool or interesting going on. Okay? Uh, well, there is something cool going on, but there's nothing very subtle going on. After you have your first round through it and you're very happy with everything, then you can go back and understand all the points about infinity, blah, blah, and it's all totally trivial. Okay? So we'll, we'll, I'll make you do it all on a problem set. But, um, but if we do it all right at the beginning, uh, you sort of feel like, God, you have to worry about everything when you're doing things. And you don't have to worry. The, the whole point of this is to make your life easy. That's uh, what I hope you'll get by the end of this lecture is when we deal with these twister, especially momentum twister variables, life is like falling off a log. <laughs> Uh, compared to the other variables that we've been um, dealing with so far. Okay, and almost never are we going to have to worry about these reality conditions, blah, blah, blah. The whole point is that we're dealing with these uh, objects uh, um, uh, in a way that's uh, signature independent, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I will make one point, which is uh, that there is uh, d just one uh, funny piece of, uh, one thing that might violate your intuition a little bit is that this notion of null ray. So we'll, we'll do much more of this, but when you're working in projective space, again, and the most naive thing that you could do is you say z is tz. That means I can use this scaling to say that this four vector to set the top component to one. Okay, and so there's a little uh, three vector there. And that means that if you want to visualize anything, just think in terms of points in three-dimensional real space. Nothing fancy going on. So we're just gonna be dealing with points, lines, planes, all sorts of geometry, but just real geometry in three-dimensional space, you can visualize it, okay? Um, okay, but in that picture, um, uh, it, when, 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 when everything is real, and it said everything real corresponds to two comma two signature, right? But when everything is real, when all these variables are real, this null ray is a two-dimensional object. I wanna stress that again, right? In the space of X is this four-dimensional, I'm imposing two linear equations on it, it's two-dimensional. Our actual picture of a null ray in space-time is one-dimensional, like a ray, right? And that's because of the that's because of our reality condition, right? So uh, it's the it's the analog of the fact that we couldn't see the three-particle amplitude uh, because uh, having lambda be lambda tilde be the complex conjugate of lambda forced forced us if we degenerate the lambdas we have to de degenerate the lambda tildes as well. So another way of saying what this, uh, uh, there's many ways of uh, saying this, but this is a particularly interesting and nice way of complexifying the space of null rays in Minkowski space. So you could have just started with that problem, okay? You want to complexify the space of null rays. There's an idiot way of complexifying the space of null rays. The space of null rays in Minkowski space is five-dimensional, okay? So you, you choose an origin and a direction to uh, point your laser beam in. Okay, so you, you so three direct three three uh, variables for the origin and two variables for where it's pointing in the sky. So the naive space of null rays in Minkowski space is five real dimensional. The naive complexification of that space would be five complex dimensional. So ten real dimensional. And we've done something cool here. The entire space is now instead of P three, 
which in the real is three real dimensional, and in the, uh, and, and the complex is six real dimensional. Okay? So it's a much smaller and more interesting and different uh, complexification of the space of null rays. Right? You can ignore that comment if you don't care about that sort of thing. Uh, um, but, um, but anyway, if you think in the real, these are sort of two planes. These x's are two planes. All right. So, yes. Yes, that's right. Exactly. Exactly. That's just, just what I was saying. So we're not, we're not forcing lambda tilde to be the complex conjugate of lambda. We're, uh, we're, asking, we're, at, we're allowing them to be totally independent. <coughs> okay, so um, so we've uh, had our first correspondence. Here is our twister space, which is a P3. So we take uh, some point Z here in twister space. And here we have space-time, and we see that we get a null ray in space-time. I'll still draw it as a one-dimensional ray. Okay, so this is a null ray. Now, let's, let's play a little bit. Let's say you take two points in twister space. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll make uh, another point. Because the conformal symmetry, sorry, before I do that, because the conformal symmetry is SL4, we are really doing projective geometry. What that means in practice is that the only, there's no metric in this space, there's no distance, nothing. The only invariant in the space is the epsilon symbol, right? So all I have, I can only contract things with the epsilon symbol. And again, we'll do this at great length uh, in the next uh, uh, few lectures, but that means things like the following. You can't talk about whether, uh, I can't talk in projective space about whether two points are close or far. There's no metric. What can I do? Let's say I'm in, uh, I'm in, um, I'm in uh, let's even imagine I'm in P3, literally what, what, what we're doing here. Um, but I can, for example, I can say I have a line. If I have a line and I have a point, I can't say if the line is close to the point, far from the point. But what I can say is whether the point is on the line or not. Okay, or if I have two lines, I can't say whether they're close or far, but I can tell whether, say whether the lines intersect or not. Okay, so all the statements are geometric statements about incidence and nothing else. Right? So this is not fancy geometry. There's a reason why these things were uh, discussed in the 1500s um, by uh, artists who were trying to learn to draw in perspective and these Argon friends. All right, so, but from our point of view, algebraically, all we ever get to contract anything with is the uh, epsilon symbol. So, and the only interesting things we're allowed to talk about are incident statements. OK, so uh, but let, let's play a little bit. So let's say we have two points, A and B, in twister space. Each one of them is, asso is uh, associated with some null ray. But we can ask the question, are there any points in common between those two null rays? So let's ask the question. So this guy is x lambda a, x alpha alpha dot, uh, lambda a alpha equals mu a alpha dot for belonging to this ray. This would be asking the same thing for b. OK, and, and now it's clear that these two, so uh, so if you want to say it geometrically, two, two planes in four dimensions intersect in a point, generically. Right? But we can also just see it algebraically. This is now four equations, two here and two here, for the four unknowns x, alpha, alpha, dot. Okay, so we can solve for x. And what is the formula for x? Well, it's the only thing it could be. So x, alpha, alpha, dot, that's in common to A and B, so let me write it, this common to both A and B, is equal to lambda alpha A mu alpha dot B minus lambda uh, alpha B mu alpha dot A over lambda A lambda B. All right, so that's, that's interesting, given two points and given two points in twister space uh, in, in this P3, um, 
there is a point in space-time. So given an A and a B, we can associate with it in this P3 of twister space. Again, back in space-time, there is associated some point, x, associated with A and B. But now notice that this, uh, this is very far from unique, right? I can, take, uh, I can take any linear combination of these equations, determine the same x, right? So in other words, let's say someone else gives me some a prime and some b prime. And their a prime and b prime is just some linear combination of a and b, any linear combination of a and b. Then the point x is going to be exactly the same. Right? So it's not the points individually, A and B, that matter. What happens if I look at some other point? Um, uh, let's say I have another point which is A prime is like 2A plus 3B. Where would that be on this picture? Oh, well, that would be somewhere between A and B on the line between A and B. And in fact, if you do all possible linear transformations, two by two linear transformations on A and B, what you'll do is move these points A and B around, but you'll keep the line invariant. OK? So we see that the real correspondence is between lines in P3, lines in twister space, and points in space time. OK? So a line in P3 corresponds to a point in space-time. If you give me, if you give me two points on the line to specify it, then that's convenient because we have this nice formula for it. But you can see that this formula is invariant under arbitrary two by two linear transformations. If you, if you define some A prime and B prime to be any linear combination of A and B, then you can see that the point X goes into itself, as it had to, right? Because we're just uh, reshuffling those equations between each other. All right, so this is our basic, most basic correspondence, summarized again. So here is the twister space. P3, here is space time, and we saw that a point Z in twister space is a null ray in space time. A point goes to a null ray. A line in twister space goes to a point X in space time. And if we're, if we're nice enough to provide two points on the line, then we can give a formula in terms of those two points, which is lambda a mu b minus lambda b mu a over lambda a lambda b. OK, now let's do a little exercise. Um, and go back to our question of the distance between two points in space-time. That's right. If you so so uh, well, we'll we'll be doing this uh, in great detail when we talk about momentum twisters in a second. But that's right. You give me a line in twister space as a point in space-time. Uh, give me another line in twister space, it's another point in space time. So that, that's just the example I'm just doing now, right? So let's say we have a line one and we have line two. Here are two generic lines. Let's say on one of them I give you some points A, B, on the other one I give you points C, D. They're generic, okay? Let's ask what is the distance between those two points. So X associated with the line A, B minus X associated with the line C, D squared. And OK, so let's just, just quickly do this. I'm not going to 
write out all, all the indices. You just want to, I just want to give you an idea of uh, where these things are coming from. So I'm going to have a lambda a mu b minus lambda b mu a minus the other way around, right? So minus, uh, uh, minus lambda c mu d minus lambda d mu c. Okay, so I'm going to sort of square this whole thing over a b squared c d squared. Lambda a, lambda b squared, lambda c squared, lambda d squared. But you can see, what am I going to get when I s square this thing up? I'm just going to get each uh, one of the indices a, b, c, d. Okay, they're all going to occur. There's four terms. They're all, they're all going to occur. And they're going to occur in every combination with the lambdas and the mu's, okay, all contracted together. So um, it's a very small exercise for you to convince yourself what this answer is. And this answer is actually just a, b, c, d divided by lambda a, lambda b, lambda c, lambda d. Or let me write it explicitly for once, uh, more explicitly, z a, z b, z c, z d. Where what is this bracket? Again, anything we see in brackets in this course is contracted with an epsilon symbol. <laughs> okay, so this bracket is just contracting Z A, Z B, Z C, Z D with an epsilon symbol. All right, so, so this is cool. The numerator of X minus Y squared is a beautiful SL4 invariant object. <laughs> It's a, right, just contracted with the uh, epsilon symbol. The denominator is not. Okay, the uh, denominator involves these, uh, the lambda components. So sometimes people introduce something called an infinity twister. And we'll see what this means in just a moment. But just again, very algebraically, I just want to define, uh, so my indices on the z were upstairs. Let me define this object curly i with two indices downstairs. We can raise and lower with the epsilon symbol. That's all we have. By the way, raising and lowering, there's no metric. All the raising and lowering can be done with the epsilon symbol. Right? So this guy is, is a 2 by 2 epsilon symbol, 0, 0, 0. Okay? So if I define that, then uh, za infinity twister zb is just lambda a lambda b. Right, and now what is this guy? This, uh, so let's, let's think a few things about uh, um, Let me come back in a second to why it's called infinity twister. But in any case, it's clearly something that breaks SL4, but it keeps uh, Poincaré. It keeps translations and uh, uh, Lorentz transformations. All right, so good, that's fine. We knew that x minus y squared is not invariant. Uh, is not conformally invariant, and, and here it is. The numerator is a nice thing, but the denominator explicitly breaks uh, conformal symmetry. However, the statement that two, th that two points are null separated should be conformally invariant. And what is that statement? That statement is that, what does it mean when this bracket is zero? Right? It means that the line AB intersects the line CD. I can say it many ways. It means that if this is 0, it means that I can express A as a linear combination of B, C, and D. That means that the four points, A, B, and C, D, lie on a, on a plane together. Right? And so that, in particular, means the lines A, B intersects the line C, D. So, so that's, that's, that's what we learn, is that if I have two generic null rays that correspond to two generic points in space-time, but if I have two null rays, uh, if I have, sorry, if I have two lines in P3 that intersect, then that means that the corresponding points in spacetime are null separated. Right? So if this is the x that goes the line AB, this is the x that goes the line CD. All right, now what else can we say in this picture? We, have some, we now have something special on this side. We have the intersection point, right? So we have this intersection point, u. 
Who is that intersection point in space-time? Well, now we also have a null ray in space-time, this null ray. So this whole null ray is you. All right? OK. So in this way, um, we have entirely geometrized, and also in a conformally friendly way, which is not non-trivial, it's very nice, every question about, uh, uh, about uh, the behavior of light-like separated objects in Minkowski space. Okay, so you, you take any question, you have a bunch of points, you want this point to be null separated from that one, that's null separated from another one, you invent sort of complicated problems like that, we'll look at a number of them. Okay? All of those naively look like slightly scary quadratic problems, because they involve statements about various xi minus xj squared going to zero. So you have lots of seemingly quadratic problems lying around. All of those problems get turned into statements about the intersection of lines and points and planes and all but just simple projective geometry questions in P3. Now, one more thing. So again, we'll be doing this in a, in a little more, in slightly more detail, in a lot more detail when we do uh, projective geometry more properly. But if I say what this correspondence is, uh, I just told you, if I say it more, more invariantly, if you give me a Z A and a Z B, and I want to talk about the line between them, well, I can take the product of Z A and Z B, and I can anti-symmetrize in these indices. Okay? So if I look at this 4 by 4 matrix that's anti-symmetric anti in those two indices, then that is an object with SL4 indices, which is invariant under doing 2 by 2 linear transformations on A and B, up to overall, up to at most an overall multiple, right? Okay, so this is the, this is the uh, projectively invariant way of talking about making a line in P3. You give me two points A and B, out of them, I can make this, uh, I can make this anti-symmetric tensor, uh, and this anti-symmetric tensor corresponds to the line in P3. Okay? So um, again, we'll see this in a lot more detail uh, next week. But I'm mentioning it now. Oh, and it's not a random anti-symmetric tensor because it has rank 1. So its determinant is 0. Okay, I've just made it. Sorry, it has rank 2. Right? It says uh, determinant 0. So anti-symmetric tensors of determinant 0 correspond to lines in P3 which in turn correspond to points in space-time. That's why this is called an infinity twister. Okay? This thing here, this is coming back to your question, okay? this thing here, it's an anti-symmetric tensor. It clearly has vanishing determinant. So it corresponds to a point in space-time. But which point in space-time? It's a point at infinity. But anyway, we'll do that in, 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 in some more detail uh, next time. All right. You can ignore that um, for now. OK, so um, now I want to talk about the relation between amplitudes and twister space. This is all totally kinematical. Um, and, uh, it, and if anything, there's something, uh, something a little bit funny, because all of these things are in coordinate space. We're really thinking about ordinary coordinate space, ordinary Minkowski space. We found this uh, twister space. That's uh, the, the twister space for ordinary Minkowski space, ordinary space time, maybe in 2 2 signature or whatever. Um, but the amplitudes don't, aren't associated with space time points. They're associated with these momenta, lambdas and lambda tildes and so on, right? So, um, so we want to see uh, some way in which uh, these things are more closely related to each other. And in fact, the relation begins from the most basic of possible places. And this is indeed a way that particle physicists, or even you know, undergraduates, could have discovered twister space, um, uh, thinking in the following way. Let's go back to something super basic and imagine solutions of the wave equation. All right. So let's say we were interested in solutions of the wave equation.
So let's say we even have something very simple, like a, like a scalar field or something. So we have some equation like box phi equals 0. And I want to characterize solutions to that equation. Well, what do the solutions of this equation look like? We know that in Fourier space, this tells us that p squared phi tilde is equal to 0, of course. So that means that, that phi should only have support on p squared equals 0. So if I write the solution back in space time, Fourier transforming back, um, the way I'd write it, let me be just a, a little bit sloppy here. Um, uh, but we'd write as d4p, but maybe some delta of p squared to force that p squared is 0. And then some e to the i px, and maybe some function of p, right? Some, some, uh, some f of p. All right, so that's the way we write it down in all the field theory books, right? Um, now, ordinarily in field theory, we make some extra, sometimes make some extra thing. Do we want the energy to be positive or negative? I'm, I'm being, that's the part I'm being slightly sloppy about here. But this is certainly the dumbest thing you would do, right? Now, uh, now what do we normally do? If you really want to be practical, you say, well, I have to solve this delta of p squared. So what we normally do is choose a frame. And in that frame, we say that p0 is equal to the magnitude of p. OK, so the usual procedure is to go from here and turn this integral into d cubed p over 2p e to the i p t minus p dot x. And then we're left with a function of just the spatial momentum p. Right? In other words, this is solving that p0 squared equals magnitude of p equals to a p squared. The delta of p squared gives me a Jacobian. That's where the 1 over 2p comes from. So that's what we normally call the Lorentz invariant phase space. And there it is, right? And we're happy with that. Now, we should not be happy with that. This sucks, right? This sucks because we've chosen a frame. Why should we have to choose a frame uh, in uh, doing this, right? Now, we know something better that we can do. We know, I mean, we, we've chosen a frame precisely because p was constrained, right? If I want to write it in a Lorentz invariant way, I have to write it as a constrained vector, right? With p squared equals 0. But we know what to do instead. How do we solve p squared equals 0? p equals lambda lambda tilde, right? So what is our, so screw all this. We know something much better to do. So uh, here it is. We say 5x is equal to, so let's first do the most naive thing. 5x is integral d squared lambda, d squared lambda tilde, e to the i lambda lambda tilde x times some, uh, some, I don't know, f of lambda and lambda tilde. See, I put p equals lambda and lambda tilde. Everything is automatically null, so I'm done. <coughs> now, there's something a little wrong with this formula. What is wrong with this formula? Well, first of all, it was clear by the time we're done, the actual integral was three-dimensional. But now it seems like our integral here is four-dimensional over lambda and lambda tilde, right? But that's our usual trouble. That's our usual, not trouble, that's our usual little group scaling. Okay? So what we should really do is write this formula. And let me write it formally for a moment. Next week, we'll understand what all these things mean in infinite detail okay? and how natural and simple they are. But let me just formally write it that I really should mod out by the overall GL1, which is the action of the little group, lambda to t lambda, lambda tilde to t inverse lambda tilde. Okay. But if you think about it, what that means is equivalent to saying, and again, this will, this will, uh, this will be done more rigorously uh, in the next few classes, but what that's equivalent to saying is, like, I can choose this t to put the top component of lambda to 1. Then lambda tilde is free. Or the other way around. So this is a little annoyance that lambda and lambda tilde you know, there are two variables that are acted on by something that looks like a rescaling, but they don't unify into a one projective object. 
right? Because they, they transform with opposite weights. That's one of many things that's going to be made nicer by twisters in a sec. Okay? So, that, so there are things where the little group acts uniformly, and that's why we just go to projective space. But for the purposes of this discussion, um, I can equivalently write this as acting the GL1 on the lambda part, and then doing d squared lambda tilde free. And then I have e to the i lambda lambda tilde x, some function of lambda and lambda tilde. All right, great. So what is this? This is an integral over d squared lambda mod GL1 of the Fourier transform of this function f, f tilde, with respect to lambda tilde. Okay? Um, but the Fourier conjugate variable to lambda tilde is actually forced, just identified here, to be x lambda. Right, so what do we have? We have an integral over d squared lambda mod gl1. That's a p1 of f tilde of lambda and, z and mu, but on the support of mu equals x lambda. That's exactly both the twister variables and the incidence relation. Okay, so another way of saying this is that I choose a function on twister space. So this is the integral d squared lambda mod gl1 f of just a z on twister space on the support of mu equals x lambda. All right, so that's a much more invariant way of writing a solution to the wave equation. This is known as the Penrose transform. Except the way that we talked about things here with these very simple Fourier transforms, when does this make sense? It makes sense in 2 comma 2 signature. <laughs> because lambda tilde is not the complex conjugate of lambda. So in 2 2 signature, this is a totally straightforward thing to do. Right? You literally Fourier transform. You go back and forth. Um, uh, uh, if you want to, but the, the final formula you can actually interpret in, in any signature. Um, and of course, Penrose originally was not thinking about 2, 2. So this, uh, the fact that things are sort of much easier to uh, think about in 2, 2 is one of the things that, uh, that uh, Witten did in his paper on this subject in uh, 2003. All right, so that tells us how we can, very simply now, how we can uh, go back and forth now between momentum space, or lambdas and lambda tildes, and twister space. Okay? And again, um, you can think of this as just a very simple way of, making, of working with variables that make the conformal transformations obvious. So let's say I have some amplitude. Let's say I have some amplitude, uh, whatever it is, it depends on the lambda and lambda tilde for some particular particle, A, and anything else, then I can do the following. I can Fourier transform this with respect to lambda tilde of particle A. E to the i lambda tilde A mu A. Okay, so remember the mu's also have alpha dot indices, so I can talk about uh, mu tilde lambda tilde. And this is now going to me give me a new function, which is going to be a function of lambda and mu. And whatever. So we're a function of the twister variable, ZA. Okay, so you want to go from ordinary spinner helicity variables to twister space, you can Fourier transform lambda tilde. Or you can Fourier transform the other way. So if I do integral d squared lambda e to the i m e to the i lambda <coughs> uh, mu tilde, uh, then I'll get a, a function of um, what we'll call uh, uh, lambda tilde, mu tilde, and everything else. And that sometimes we'll call w.
No, no, this is everything in momentum space now. Okay, this is a, uh, yeah, lambda is the, yeah, so, so this just shows you that the role of the x in the incidence relation is to take you from the, f to plane wave solutions to solutions in position space. <laughs> right, so this was in the end, I should have said this was 5x in the end, right? But, uh, that just, the, but that's just, that just tells you, if you want to just work purely in momentum space, you just Fourier transform with respect to lambda tilde. Or with respect to lambda, you have a choice. So then there's two kinds of twister variables. Okay? They're Okay, but the kind of the the first immediate payoff of all of this is what are the conformal transformations? Well, again, conformal transformations are just four by four linear transformations on the z variables or the w variables. So, what are the conformal transformations? Conformal transformations are are let's say z i d d z j. Right? That's just what general linear transformations are. So let's look at various components of these guys. So let's just decompose this into lambdas and mu's. Right? So for instance, there's a piece here which is lambda dd lambda. That's Lorentz. One copy of Lorentz. There's the other piece uh, which is mu dd mu. Okay, so these guys are Lorentz. There is something which is lambda d d mu. Okay, so what is lambda d d mu? Back in terms of the original variables. Okay, remember mu is the conjugate of lambda tilde. So when I hit d d mu, it's like pulling down the lambda tilde. Okay, so this thing back in terms of lambdas and lambda tildes is just lambda, lambda tilde. So what is this? This is just a translation. This is the momenta, right? So th these are the translation operator. Finally, there's the last one, which is mu alpha dot dd lambda alpha. So what is that back in terms of lambdas and lambda tildes? Well, what is mu? Mu is dd lambda tilde. OK, so you see the special conformal transformations are these funny, as always, there are these funny quadratic things. Okay, they're d squared lambda tilde, d squared lambda. OK? And so once again, I could have just said that conformally invariant amplitudes are things that are annihilated by Lorentz transformations, translations, so we put a delta function for the momentum conservation, and this funny quadratic operator. right? But in twister space, it's just four by four linear transformation. OK? Let's actually very quickly, this is since we've just seen uh, our first encounter with the special, with these, uh, with these uh, symmetries for amplitudes, let's actually check that, let's say, the Park Taylor formula, uh, you know, ij to the fourth over 1, 2, 2, 3, and 1. And there's a delta function for momentum conservation. So this is the amplitude. Is it invariant under all these things? Well, it's obviously Lorentz invariant. It's obviously translational invariant. So the interesting thing is that guy. I'll leave it uh, to you to do a le little exercise to see what happens when that generator hits the delta function. <laughs> But we can see kind of clearly why it's invariant. <laughs> the interesting part is invariant. This thing doesn't even depend on lambda tildes at all. Okay. So in fact, anything that's holomorphic, anything that's just a function of the lambdas and not the lambda tildes would be conformally invariant. Okay. And in particular, the Park Taylor amplitude is uh, conformally invariant. OK. Another important point is that Uh, as I said already, the little group scalings are as simple as possible now in twister space, right? So let's say I took a uh, let's say I took a negative helicity uh, gluon or graviton. Let's say a gluon amplitude uh, as a function of lambda and lambda tilde, and I Fourier transform with respect to lambda tilde. Sorry. 
So this is going to be some m of z. And this thing, m minus of z. And now it's clear that the lambda tilde has the opposite weight as the negative helicity gluon, lambda tilde as, as the helicity plus, right? So d squared lambda tilde eats up the weight of the uh, negative helicity gluon. So we discover that m minus of tz is just equal to m of z. Beautiful. No scaling at all. No opposites for lambda and lambda tilde. Dead projective. <laughs> okay, so you rescale z. And uh, um, yeah, so so the the uh, so this is literally projectively invariant. What if I take a positive helicity amplitude? Now this thing is going to pick up a weight, right? And lambda tilde is, has a weight four. So this whole thing is going to pick up. So m m plus of T z is going to pick up uh, a weight t to the fourth m of z. So already you see something slightly interesting here, that in twister space we said the null rays don't depend on the overall scale. They don't. The actual amplitudes carry a little bit of information about the overall scaling of these vectors, and that's exactly what, what encodes the helicity. Okay? So the amplitude should be homogeneous functions of appropriate weight uh, under, this, uh, under this rescaling. If we're doing, okay? Yeah, that's right. So that's uh, so so uh, that that's just what I'm coming to now. And so uh, so y I'll just leave you the trivial exercise of working out what all the different kind of uh, amplitudes are. But now we can go to twister space in many ways. Okay, we can decide to uh, transform our amplitudes in. Oh, sorry. Let me say a final final thing. Uh, what is Susie? So now we can talk about super twister space. Everything is exactly the same. Uh, and the whole point of all of our notation from before is that you can just follow your nodes, right? So uh, if I'm transforming here, then I should integrate also with respect to the eta tilde variables. Okay, so I would do, let's say for gluons, I would do d squared lambda d4, or general dn eta tilde, e to the i lambda mu tilde, e to the eta tilde, uh, sorry, lambda tilde mu, e to the eta tilde eta of m of lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde. And this would give me an m of a calligraphic z of everyone, where this calligraphic z is the ordinary z and four eta variables. Okay? So this is i, some other i, going from 1 to 4, different i's running out of indices, a equals 1 to 4. Right? And what is the super conformal group? The super conformal group is uh, SL4 slash 4. That's what it's called. That's just a name. So the super conformal group is SL4 slash 4. That just means that the generators are these calligraphic A, D, D, calligraphic B. For Calligraphic A and B run over both bosonic and fermionic things. Okay? So for instance, there are new things in here like an eta DDZ or a Z DD eta. And you can translate those things back to space time if you like to get the DD lambdas and the lambdas and all the different elements of the superconformal group. Okay? But if you've ever suffered through the superconformal group in ordinary variables with Xs, um, it's very hard to, at least very hard for me to remember everything. It's totally trivial to remember here, right? It's just SL4 slash 4, just linear transformations, linear super transformations, which means the generators are just these Z, D, D, Zs. Okay? Is it clear what these things are, right? So the bosonic ones are Z, D, D, Z. The super ones are eta, D, D, Z, and Z, D, D, eta. Okay, some of those are super conformal, some of those are special super conformal. And then finally, who's eta, D, D, eta? Eta dd eta are the rotations on the etas. That's the R symmetry. Okay. So the thing that rotates all those uh, indices together. All right. So, so that's the first most obvious way to go from amplitudes to uh, twister space. Um, uh, to, to transform amplitudes into twister space. And so let's just get our first taste 
of what amplitudes look like in this twister space. Just so you know, we're not going to spend a lot of time in this twister space in the rest of this course. Um, it'll be there, and, and in fact, as we'll understand when we see the connection with the uh, Grassmannian, once you have the connection to the Grassmannian, sliding back and forth between all these twister spaces is going to turn into uh, all these spaces, momentum space, twister space, momentum twister space, all those things is going to sort of turn into a piece of cake. Okay, so we're not going to, uh, but uh, for reasons that will become clear in a, in a moment, um, while this Twister space, I mean, it's important, and, there, uh, and we might go back there more explicitly eventually, um, things are going to be much more practical and down to earth and visualizable in, the, uh, in this so-called momentum Twister space that I'll describe in a moment. Okay? Um, but still, this was also historically very important and just gives you some idea for the kind of structures that we're going to uh, run into um, when we start uh, using uh, better variables for the amplitudes. You, you can think of our march so far, again, we're in pure responsible territory. We've done nothing adventurous. Okay, we're just saying, what are the symmetries? Let's make the symmetries as manifest as possible. Let's just work with the best variables we can. Right? This is just good old-fashioned responsible theoretical physics. And let's just see but if, we're, if we're rewarded by, for being responsible. Right? So, um, so let's look at our first example. Uh, oh, but we can go to twister space in various ways, as people said uh, uh, already. For example, the simplest thing I could do is to just, is just uh, Fourier transform all the lambda tildes. To go to some m hat. So this would use the z variables for uh, the z twister variables for everybody. Something else that I could do, which is uh, rather natural seeming, is I could Fourier transform with respect to the d squared lambda tildes for the positive helicity variables and d squared lambda for the negative helicity particles. Okay? So then I would do, for some of them, I'd e, e to the i lambda tilde a mu a. For the other ones, I'd do e to the i lambda a mu tilde a. And then this will give me a function of z's for the positive helicity guys, uh, or, or sorry, uh, I said it backwards, minus and plus. A z for the negative helicity guys and w for the positive helicity guys. Why is this natural? Because if I do that, the amplitudes have no weight at all, right? The little group weight is that it's just invariant under rescaling z and uh, w. Okay, and all right, so. Uh, so, so um, historically, this this is what uh, uh, Witten started doing in uh, 2003. So let's do our first simplest example of that, and already we're going to see something very cool happening. So let's take the Park-Taylor formula, Park-Taylor amplitude, and take it to twister space a la method one. You can do anything else that we want to, but let's just look at what happens under method one. So I want to take integral d squared lambda tilde 1 through d squared lambda tilde n, e to the i lambda tilde a mu a, and then, I don't know, i j to the fourth over 1, 2, 2, 3, and 1, delta sum of lambda a, lambda tilde a. OK? So far, so good? Now, thank God we chose to do this one, because this looks scary. But it only depends on the lambdas, not the lambda tildes. Very good. We just take it out. Okay? So the only thing we have to deal with is this delta function for momentum conservation. So well, let's. Uh, write that delta function where it came from to begin with, as an integral over space time. Let's write as an integral d4x e to the i x dot p. Okay, so this integral is equal to, so let's pull out all the Park Taylor stuff. We don't need it. I have a d4x alpha alpha dot, and I have uh, for each a, I have a product over a, e to the i, lambda tilde a mu a, and then an e to the i, x alpha alpha dot, the sum over a, 
of lambda a, lambda tilde a. Right? That's just the momentum conservation guy. All right, now this is super easy because all of these, oh, and then I have d squared lambda tilde 1, d squared lambda tilde n. Now this is easy because each one of the, let me put a minus sign, each one of these, uh, each one of the lambda tilde integrals is just going to give me a delta function. Right? So this in the end is just this stuff times a, for each a, a separate, uh, and an integral d4x, sorry, integral d4x, but for each a, I have a delta squared of mu a minus x lambda a. OK, so that's kind of a cool formula. If I really want to get the final answer, I'd have to integrate, figure out how to integrate this over x's. But we immediately learn something interesting from this formula. This tells us every single particle a satisfies that mu equals x lambda for the same x. In other words, unless there exists some x for which, so give me some random configuration of uh, mu's and lambdas, right? Unless there exists some x for which mu equals x lambda for all of the particles, the amplitude will be 0. I don't know what the x is. But there has to be some x for which mu equals x lambda for all the particles. Now, what did it mean that mu equals x lambda? You remember? That was the null ray that was associated, right? And we learned, so, um, okay, so that means that there must be some line in P3. There must be a line on P3 where all the Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4 are on that line. Okay, the fact that mu equals x lambda for the same x, right? So that x is now, uh, that x is a point in space-time, it's a line in P3. The fact that mu equals x lambda means that the z lies on that line. And every single one of them has got a lie in that line. So this is really remarkable. We see that the park taylor amplitude in twister space is supported on a line. All right? And that was uh, all the hint that, the, that uh, Witten needed to within, well, six months of hard work, generalize that to amplitudes in general should be supported on degree k curves <laughs> if we go beyond uh, uh, Park-Taylor amplitudes to more complicated amplitudes. The simplest ones are supported on lines. In general, they're supported on quadratics, cubics, higher, higher degree curves. But this is the sort of first indication that there's something interesting going on, right? That uh, when we go to twister space, the amplitudes start getting this geometric quality to them <laughs> that we don't see so obviously in terms of lambdas and lambda tildes. Yes? Yeah, that's what they are. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, that, that means that, 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 that um, well, that's what that delta function is telling you. Exactly. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, the, so, so we see that this is just the Fourier transform of the delta function and uh, nothing else. Right. Um, but indeed, you, I mean, precisely because all we're doing is transforming back and forth is a pr very particular combination of plane wave states that you can think of as, uh, uh, yeah. Now, uh, let's look at one of the other amplitudes. And um, this time, um, uh, you're going to do some of these exercises on your problem set. If, uh, but uh, we're going to motivate the answer. So let's take, um, let's take another amplitude. Let's take a, a three-particle amplitude. Yes. That's right. That's right. You put any holomorphic thing here, and the same thing would be true. Okay. That's right. All right. Now let's look at this this amplitude. So this is uh, one two cubed over one three two three. 
and with the delta function. Now let's take this guy into twister space to get a function of, uh, but let's take it the other way so that uh, uh, the little group scaling was as nice as possible. So I want to do it so I get a function of z1, z2, and w3. Okay, so I'm going to uh, Fourier transform d squared lambda tilde 1, d squared lambda tilde 2, but d squared lambda 3, okay, et cetera. So I'm going to get some amplitude as a function of two z's and a w. Now this is a little bit less trivial, right? When you do the last integral, you have to worry about these poles and so on, okay? I'm not going to do the exercise for you in real time. You'll do it on the, uh, you'll do it on the problem set. But I want to point out something just ahead of time. What could the answer possibly be? Remember, this needs to be something that has vanishing weight under rescaling any of z1, z2, or w3. So what could the answer possibly be? What kind of answer could you have that would have no weight at all? Remember, when we were dealing with these amplitudes in momentum space, we said if we just had a scalar, it has no weight, the amplitude is a constant. That's it. Right? And only when it had helicity and so on did we get interesting things, right? Well, here, same situation. The amplitudes have no weight under rescaling 1, 2, or 3. So what could the answer possibly be? Well, it's not a constant, and it's not 0. It's not a constant, and it's not 0. But we've already seen here the amplitudes have kind of singular support in twister space, right? When you go to twister space, you find their support on lines and so on. Well, this is even more striking. The amplitude turns out to be the sine of z1 dot w3 times the sine of z2 dot w3. And in fact, if you're a little careful, there's in fact a funny sign that involves an infinity twister. It doesn't quite, it's not quite conformally invariant. So let me put this in quotes. Okay. But let's ignore that for a second. The answer is just, now remember the z's and w's have indices in opposite sides, because I transformed oppositely, so I, I, I can contract, they have an upstairs and a downstairs index. Okay, so this thing is indeed invariant under rescaling. <laughs> the sine function, extremely non-smooth, incredibly non-smooth, non but it's already a very early hint that in this space, there's, the amplitudes are like zero or one, or minus one or one. It's kind of amazing how, how uh, uh, what, a, what a binary feeling <laughs> they have to them already, okay? Uh, what about gravity? That's the gravity amplitude. And now, this thing that I erased in, in quotes, well, that really does break conformal invariant. <laughs> and that's fine. Gravity is not conformally invariant. Okay. So in going from Yang-Mills to gravity, you just remove the signs and you uh, um, uh, actually turn them into absolutes. Sorry, I, I should be. So it's the signs multiplied by the, uh, by the actual uh, z dot uh, w's. OK? This is a very peculiar fact already in the three particle amplitude that, uh, that when you go to twister space, you don't quite get something conformally invariant. I promised you everything was conformally invariant. So what the hell is going on? Well, what's going on is that um, these things that we're not, we're not going to talk a lot about uh, until maybe uh, uh, the end of the course, um, but there are various, in ordinary momentum space, there are various singular configurations where even these tree amplitudes blow up. Like when you hit these poles, or in particular, these collinear limits. Right? Now, I, I, I said very blithely to you, I said very blithely that the Proc-Taylor amplitude is conformally invariant. It's so obvious, it's holomorphic, right? So, and there's a DD lambda tilde there. So obviously it's invariant. All right, well, but anyone who's uh, ex experienced even has a, just a tiny bit of fun with these kind of things, knows that that's not quite right because of this wonderful fact 
that dd by dz bar of 1 over z is not 0. This is, in fact, delta squared of z. OK, so there are tiny things that are often called holomorphic anomalies. <laughs> um, there is a little, uh, so everything is conformally invariant when you're away from these singular configurations where you have uh, collinear singularities. And in momentum space, it's easy to stay away from them. Right? Well, you just say, I'm not there. At least at tree level, it's easy to stay away from them. At loop level, it's harder to stay away from them because you're <laughs> integrating over everything. And that's the origin of the infrared divergences and all, all kind of other stuff that are subtle you have to think about. Okay? Now, when you go to twister space, you, you don't have the luxury of, of, of avoiding it. You're transforming over everything. So poof, it just hits you in the face. right? And that breaking of conformal symmetry is interestingly shows up in these factors. Uh, see, notice this thing looks like lambda 1, lambda 2. OK? Right, sine z1, i, z2 is exactly something that looks like lambda 1, lambda 2. If you're in a configuration where the lambdas never become parallel to each other, the sine is, let's say, plus 1. So you don't notice anything about it. But it's exactly in those collinear configurations. Those are exactly the things that were in the denominator of the Park-Taylor factor that caused us, uh, that caused us uh, trouble. Okay? Now, I'm highlighting all of these things. Um, uh, and we're, we're, we'll start with momentum twister space uh, 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 next time, actually. Um, and that'll, that'll, that'll even more uh, beautifully segue into our discussion of projective geometry. But this is the sort of the first way you can go into twister space, the obvious twister space that's associated with the obvious conformal symmetry. What you see already is that these amplitudes in twister space are, are there's something very beautiful about them, but they're singular and a little subtle. Okay? Um, and so um, uh, what we're going to do next time is, is, uh, is talk about another conformal symmetry, <laughs> a different conformal symmetry. Um, this is a hidden conformal symmetry that many theories we know and love actually have. This hidden conformal symmetry is actually associated with another spacetime uh, where the units in that spacetime are momenta. Okay, so it's kind of a dual of the ordinary conformal symmetry. And because that hidden conformal symmetry exists, um, it's useful to introduce the twisters for that spacetime. Now, the map between that twister space and ordinary lam lambdas and lambda tildes is just algebraic. There's just a formula. You take the z's, you write lambda, lambda tilde as some function of the z's. There's no transforming. There's nothing. It's just yet a better set, one more better set of variables. And as we'll see, this set of variables completely trivialize everything about kinematics. Um, so far, we've managed to trivialize, in working with lambdas and lambda tildes, we've trivialized that uh, the momenta are null. But we still haven't trivialized momentum conservation. In other words, you're a practical person. You want to actually you know, plonk down a bunch of lambdas and lambda tildes on the computer and you know, just, uh, just uh, talk about some problem. Well, you can't just do it, because at the end, you've got to solve this quadratic condition that the sum of all the lambda lambda tildes equals 0. Right, anyone who's ever done this on a computer knows, well, you pick one of the momenta, and you've got to solve the other one in terms of there's some square root. Right? You actually have to solve. You can't just, I can't just. Uh, cleanly parametrize the space of all scattering data in a simple way. There's still this constraint. We're going to see when we go to this dual space time that we will see the hidden conformal symmetry. Even more importantly, we'll trivialize momentum conservation. And we'll find a set of completely unconstrained variables that build for us null momenta that conserve momentum. Okay? And that's why this space is uh, is the nicest place, uh, at, at least at the moment, to uh, talk about the physics of, of some uh, uh, of amplitudes in, in, a, in a wide class of theories. Okay? So, um, so we'll eventually have functions of totally random variables, totally unconstrained, and then we'll start seeing uh, uh, some physics and geometry in that space. All right? um, but this is not going to be very far away, and every now and then I'll come, come back to it. In particular, when we talk about these things called uh, on-shell diagrams in, uh, in a week or two, um, those things that will be very naturally motivated by physics turn out via this connection to also precisely be objects that Penrose and Hodges started talking about in the year I was born, 1972. Right, so.